Broadcasting from Orchard Park, New York, and Boca Raton, Florida, it's the Freight 360 Podcast. From freight broker sales tips to sports talk, this podcast is all about helping you grow as a freight broker. We're your hosts, Nate Cross and Benjamin Kowalski. Let's talk freight. All right, welcome back for episode 157 of the Freight 360 Podcast. We always love these special episodes when we get to have a guest on, and we definitely do today, and we're going to get there in just a minute. Uh, But first, if you are brand new, welcome to Freight 360. If you've been with us for a while, welcome back. Keep sending us all your questions. We got three really awesome Q&A questions that came in from the community that we'll get to at the end of the episode. Keep sharing us with your friends in the industry and um, leave that review. Leave those five stars. It helps us rank higher on iTunes. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment, hit the subscribe button, and Make sure to like the video. So without further ado, we have a special guest today. We have Doug Nelson from Blue Book Services. Doug, you are the Vice President of Trading Assistance. Welcome to the show. How are you today? Thanks. I'm good. Thank you very much. Awesome. Well, like I said, Ben and I love having guests on here. And we've got a three-part series that we're going to be doing um, with Blue Book over the next, really throughout the rest of the year here. We're going to hit on a lot of topics surrounding the fresh fresh food and produce sector, everything from uh, high level overviews to claims and best practices and loading and unloading procedures and all that good stuff. But um, give us a little, you know, just for anyone out there who's not familiar with you or really with with Blue Book, give us a little rundown on kind of what you do there and um, what Blue Book is overall as a company. Sure. Um, Blue Book's it's credit and marketing information, really business information to the fresh produce industry. Um, we're probably thought first thought of first and foremost for our um, for our credit ratings, um, but the marketing information as we'll as we'll talk about is also a big part of what we do. Dispute resolution has been a part of what the company's done throughout its long history. It's a 120 plus year old uh, company, um, and is is always done um, that kind of like writing trading guidelines for the for the uh, for the produce industry that kind of a thing. Uh, recently, we started. We got into to, uh, to a, a newsletter, an electronic newsletter. We also have a magazine covering the produce industry. So really, it's it's business information as well. Um, I'm in my involvement is is most directly with uh, with our dispute resolution. I worked for. I started in the produce industry with the USDA's uh, PACA branch doing dispute resolution. That's pretty much limited to vendor uh, vendor vendor disputes, uh, and then came came to Blue Book in 2006, where we also not only do we do vendor to vendor, but we also do disputes between um, between carriers, brokers, uh, and produce vendors. Awesome, cool. I appreciate that. Um, well, yeah, definitely looking forward to to pick your brain over these these few episodes that we're going to do with you guys and. Um, Ben, what's new in South Florida? How are you doing today, man? I have been better. I have been sick since last night, but I will pull through. It's not like COVID round three or anything, is it? Honestly, I don't know. I've I've had a fever and the chills since like middle of last night, swollen throat, can't swallow anything, just, I don't know, sick. I'd be the third time, yeah, that I've had COVID if it is... Uh, or my daughter just started preschool and she also had been sick. So it's also could be just a bunch of crumb snatchers, passing germs that I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, fair enough. Hey, when, when in doubt, you got, you got me and Doug here to, to pull the, uh, or steer the ship. So all good. Uh, well, Hey, I do, you know, we, uh, we often like to give our take on, you know, what's going on in sports. And even though we have a, a rogue listener that didn't like, doesn't like having to fast forward through five, the first five minutes to get to the content. But I have to I have to give a shout out to my Buffalo Bills. I made a prediction. What's that, Ben? I was going to say he thanked us, actually. Did you see that? Um, I did not. I did not. Yeah, I caught that. He had like actually thanked us for putting the timestamp in. For so here's what I, what I realized, though. I don't think I put the timestamp on YouTube. I think I only put it in the show notes for the podcast. So I got to make sure I, I keep doing that on YouTube as well. So. Uh, but hey, the Buffalo Bills, I made a bold prediction last week that they would win by double digits, and they sure did. A 31 to 10 victory in LA over the Super Bowl reigning champs. And um, that's that's not to uh, that's not to say that they've got no competition out there because the Kansas City Chiefs also looked super hot for the AFC last week. Mahomes put up crazy offense. Even Pittsburgh, Ben, I watched your Steelers game 
And man, against Cincinnati. So I did say take the spread. I think they'd cover it. I didn't think they were going to win, and they did. But apparently no one knows how to kick a field goal on either team because it Clearly. was doink or miss left or whatever. But um, hey, they're back. Off to yeah. you won week one last year, and you won again week one this year. So I mean, yeah, they. I mean, they squeeze it out. It was either the best game, I think, or the worst game I've ever seen. But Hey, a win's a win. I think the downside is, you know, TJ Watts out for the season. So that's going to hurt the rest of the year. Yeah. Those WAP boys, man, I feel like they're like they're injury prone and you never really know what's going to happen. But um, hopefully he has, a, he has a good recovery and can get back on the field at some point. Um, Doug, you said you off air, you're a Michigan State fan. So go Spartans. I, you know, I'm a. Uh, if I pick a team in NCAA, it's it's the Florida Gators. But Michigan State was always a number two of mine because a buddy I used to work with at a trucking company, he got me into uh, watching Michigan State. How are they doing this year? I actually haven't followed any of their games, but how are they looking? They're, they're looking. They got some big bodies running around there. They got they got receivers running all over the place uh, that the rest of the team, you know, maybe uh, maybe we'll see. But uh, they're, they're 2-0 against lesser competition. They got University of Washington primetime uh, Saturday, so – That'll be the test. There you go. Yeah, I mean those those like you know, the first two weeks. A lot of times these teams they like they pad their schedule with some really easy teams. But uh, hey, if you win the must win games, you know you're 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 still in it. And you're right. This weekend will be the I guess the testament to what kind of a caliber team they are. But all right, good stuff. I'll I'll make my Bills Week Two prediction at the end of the episode here. So Ben, let's give a shout out to our friends over at DAT, and then we'll get into it. Taking the guesswork out of freight with DAT. The DAT Load Board Network is the largest on-demand freight marketplace in North America, connecting freight brokers with available capacity on any lane. Grow your business with tools that allow you to find new business partners, and you can quickly qualify and onboard new carriers. And with the industry's leading freight rate data, you can make clear and confident pricing decisions. Check out the show notes for 30 days free of DAT Power, Express, or Trucker's Edge. Definitely. Hey, man, I, you're even if you're sick, you pulled it off. Your voice sounds pretty good. So, um, all right. So today's episode, the really the, the first of three episodes we're going to do with Blue Book, we want to hit on um, some high level stuff with the produce industry and with what Blue Book Services is. So we titled this episode, How to Find and Vet Shippers with Blue Book Services. So the finding part, obviously, we can talk about prospecting through members of the Blue Book um, database, I guess, if you want to call it that. And then vetting is big with credit reporting. So I could tell you at Pierce Worldwide Logistics, where, where I work um, in brokerage, we get emails about, you know, if a, if a customer of ours or someone that we follow has had an update in their credit report, we're often asked to provide um, payment terms or payment details for certain folks in there as well. So that's about my extent of the credit side of it. But um, Doug, if you don't mind, just, you know, you kind of gave a high level overview on what Blue Book is, but let's kind of talk about the credit side of it. So who are the members of Blue Book services, specifically the produce Blue Book, and what kind of information is being reported in there or provided to the members just to kind of give a, a quick overview on it? Yeah. So uh, produce buyers and sellers, um, they're often you know, buying and selling from from one another. So they've got access to um, to, you know, all, a host of information, but including how, how quickly they're paying bills, how they're handling disputes, et cetera. Um, and, and truck brokers, carriers use, use the information the same way as a, as a produce seller. Um, you know, am I comfortable extending credit to, to this firm? Um, and if so, how much? Um, and, and also on more of a general of just who is this, this, you get a random call out of the blue. Somebody wants, wants a truck, somebody wants a load of produce. Who is this, who is this firm on the end of the, end of the line? Um, go to Blue Book and, and, you know, gauge their legitimacy, gauge their credit worthiness, um, see the kind of experience other Blue Book members are reporting with this firm. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. Let me throw something out there too, because a question I really have is like, this is, I don't know of any other thing in transportation that allows you to search credit to prospect. Like, I don't know of anything that is even comparable in any commodity and anything. Yeah, because typically, if you think about it, if you're prospecting, you don't know the credit until you know who the prospect is. Yeah. And then you maybe you got to pay to get a credit report through some credit agency. 
And, where, and, and I have a few clients that use this on a daily, weekly basis, and that's one of the main functions they do when they're pulling together who they're going to go after, prospect, and which market. Like They know at the very least they're not spinning their wheels trying to build a relationship with a company that isn't paying their bills, right? Like, And again, to be able to maximize the time you're spending and to not waste your time trying to build a relationship with a company that isn't worth building, I think is a huge asset. So let me ask you this too on top of that is – so you mentioned, obviously, you've got like produce brokers in there, sellers um, or dealers, right? You've got freight brokers, truck brokers, motor carriers. Do you have a rough idea of like the member count total and um, roughly how much fall into each one of those buckets? Or is that proprietary secret? Yeah, yeah I'm going to get myself in trouble. <laughs> it, it, it's, in the, it's in the thousands. Okay. That's good, though. I mean, obviously... You, we see people out there that they're like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll sell you a, a customer or shipper list and it's got like, you know, 2000 garbage companies that everyone's calling on. But um, I'll tell you, I've been in there and there is a, I, I won't, you know, I, I won't say a number, but there is a plentiful amount of um, members that are in there and amounts of information there. So I, I would say hands down, if, if you're doing anything in the produce realm as a freight broker, uh, it's a it's a must have membership to be a part of it. So um, I learned to speak. I, 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 oh, sorry. Well, I just want to say make a distinction real quick. We list people that aren't members, so our listings. I can say that there's ten thousand listings in the mm -hmm. in the book. So it's not it's not a deal where you can think. Okay, there's a there's a, an a, an active um, produce shipper there that's not in the book because they're not a, a, a Blue Book member. If the guy wasn't a Blue Book member, if that company was a Blue Book member, they'd still be listed because they're they're an active member of the produce industry. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And that's huge because I know there's like, I've heard uh, stories about people saying, well, my, my credit rating with like D&B, unless you're a member, you know, you don't get, you know, your listing won't be as as accurate or something like that, but no, that makes sense. So like, but so a member, let's say, you know, I'm a freight broker. I can report on a, a produce company that is not actually a member of Blue Book, but they're listed in there. Correct. So we're trying okay. to be comprehensive and give you yeah. the information in the credit information on everybody that's a factor in the industry, not just members. The members are the only ones that get the, get our information though. Gotcha. And here's the thing that I also wanted to um, talk a little bit about. Doug mentioned this briefly, but in my whole career, I have flipped three customers in one phone call, two of them which came out of Blue Book, and they were from the feature that you just mentioned. Like the brokerage I was working at, at the time, like we had our own Blue Book number, right? So they were able to vet us the same way we were them. And just by giving that number, like the trust was literally there. Like they set me up there with watermelon shippers. And they were literally one phone call. Hey, what's your blue book number? I could see their details. They could see how people reported on our brokerage at the time. And they're like, yeah, as long as your rates are good, we're good. Literally on board and started moving loads the next week. It's, it's funny. I think of like the analogy because, you, know, you know, normally if you're if you're prospecting a new company, you don't have much information on them. You may have like a website or something like that. But it's kind of like if someone's dating, right, and they just meet somebody randomly, they don't know it's anything like, about them until they go through that first handful of conversations. And that's how often how prospecting with free brokerage is. But it's almost like when you with, with call your exes. Book, yeah, it's like you stop <laughs> their entire like social media presence uh -huh. and you see their Instagram and their Facebook and everything to kind of get like a little bit of a, a snapshot of what they look like overall. So I want to hear what your last five significant others have had to say about you. Right? <laughs> Let's see how you guys... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So why did you really break up? Oh, you weren't yeah. paying your bills on time. No. Um, so talk to me, I guess, the credit part of it. Um, you know, I, different companies have different ways of rating folks. Uh, you know, hey, you're a rated uh, out of a scale of 100 or there's like, a, you know, some use like a letter. Um, you know, you're rated an A or an A plus. What is what is the rating system look like with Blue Book? And where does that I guess, how is the determination made? What kind of factors are we looking at to come up with this? So, so we've got two forms, two basic forms in our, in our credit rating system. One is a score, like a, it's a FICO, it's a, a, like a FICO type score, like you'd have for your personal credit rating system. And that goes, that goes any, anywhere from five to five, from 500 to a thousand. Um, anything, um, you know, and I've seen some of the, some of the, I'm not in our credit group, but I've seen some of the, some of the way they, they track this. And the, the likelihood of a company going out of business or having a significant default um, in the next 12 months is significantly reduced any, anything less than, than 750. 
the odds okay. of that are, 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 are very low. It's, it, it, the system does a great job of, of tracking that. Um, a new score is issued every, every month. But kind of our bellwether rating is our, it, w- it would, would be m- probably most familiar to both of you uh, and, and uh, many of your listeners would be, would be the X rating, where we're giving a credit, a credit worth estimate of the company. Um, so that g- gives some idea of the, the financial strength of the company, the financial wherewithal of the company. Then we're giving an X rating, which assesses the experience from the experience um, as judged by other um, produce industry members. So was your experience with with this with this buyer um, excellent? Was it good? Was it was it unsatisfactory? Was it poor? And from that, you know, they'll they'll be pooled together, and the average will 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 be incorporated into that rating. So a three x, um, you know, hundred m would be a hundred thousand credit worth estimate. A three x would be a good rating. Four uh, x would be excellent to to unsatisfactory. And then um, then the last is a is a letter grade, which indicates how fast the company pays its bills. Okay. Gotcha. So the, the FICO score is real responsive because it changes every month, but there's a lot of information packed in that historical X rating. Gotcha. So let me ask you this then. So, you know, there's obviously any kind of shipper or, or company out there has different types of bills. So like in, in general, in, in freight brokerage, if we look at a customer's payment history, we could look at specifically how are they paying their 3PLs and um, truckload carriers versus, you know, other vendors. So it does Blue Book with the credit analysis or the credit rating, it, does it differentiate between payment for transportation and freight services versus the, you know, the seller to the buyer type thing? How, how does yeah, that yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a great question because, you know, in, in Produce, we got the pack of trust where, uh, produce vendors really need to get their their produce sellers paid. Um, it's, so so it, that's a significant in, in, issue in produce, maybe more so than in other industries. The basic rating you're not going to be able to see. You know, if it, there are three X C, you're not going to know if that was comprised mostly of, of, of from produce feedback or, or mostly from from broker feedback. However, in our claims activity table, you're definitely going to be able to see if claims are being filed um, by uh, for transportation claims uh, and by uh, by transportation companies or by vendors. So you would be able to get a sense there in many cases if, if this is a firm that is great with their produce guys, um, but 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 it's not uh, not working well with their transportation providers. Okay. Now, can you see like a historical trend, like how things have been trending over the last maybe handful of months or something like that? Like, let's say someone has a, a good rating, but you could see that, you know, it's been, it's actually been coming down or vice versa. Is there any way to see a trend line? Right. Yeah. The, the scores work really well with that. And there's a trend line right on the page and you'll be able to right on, on the main page when you go to look up a, a company, you'll be able to see that. You know, the, the kind of the maybe the the pro tip um, would be if the company's a three X, you know, the X ratings don't they, they may they may hold for um, years at a time. And um, and the, the danger there is you may think this guy's a three X C. Um, I know what a three X C is. Our credit policy is, you know, we can extend thirty thousand um, dollars without, you know, any further approval to a three X C, let's just say. Well, if, if you really want to get out, out ahead of it, if this is a, a customer that wants to do more and you'd like to extend that credit up to, to 50000 well, you could look behind the scenes and see, like, how strong is that 3X rating? Um, you know, maybe maybe it's it's maybe maybe there's only three and four X's on this guy for the last 18 months, um, but it's still not enough to get, to, to get this company to a four. Or maybe maybe it's a really weak three X that's on the verge of dropping to a to a two X, and maybe thirty thousand. Your initial policy is too much, so maybe that's a that's a guy. If you, if you look and see that they've got some one X ratings coming in in the last month or the last the last ninety days, that may be a guy to scale back. And that's kind of it where where you could by refining your you know doing a good job as a credit extender, you could limit losses and also grow business and not not be too rigid and tight with it at times and not be lo- too loose at other times um, and and, um, and and subject subject yourself to bad business. So back to one of the things I said towards the beginning was you know I, I've seen periodic emails come through to our like our internal credit department at the brokerage. And it will get notified about certain things. And I, I'll be honest, I haven't taken too close of a look at them, but 
Um, if I'm not mistaken, we would get notified of something new popping up on one of the one of the produce companies that we've looked up or have credit extended out for. And we've also been asked to provide uh, like payment feedback and stuff like that. So what what kind of I guess what is all that? What you know? What kind of alerts are our produce blue book members getting, and what you know? What kind of data is being um, shared from us as brokers to provide that information, or to right. kind of give you, you guys those credit ratings? Right. Well, we do we do survey the trade for so for everyone that you that you've told us you you deal with, we're going to survey you. Firms re- return that data to us. We we assess it, interpret it, and then and then that that goes into into the rating. Um, okay. The, the the alerts report is is really nice, but it's 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 more useful, I think, or it's useful in in a broader way than what you suggested there. It, if a, if a company's uh, so one of your key accounts, their um, their rating drops by by their score drops by thirty points, you're going to get that alert and, I, and realize, hey, something's going on here. But the alerts report actually it goes it provides some other information that I think is equally valuable. Um, for instance, it'll, it'll say personnel changes. So, you know, if, you, if you're if you um, a credit manager at a company and maybe you only care about credit, but if you're an account manager or you're, you're a, sales, a sales representative for a company and, and you get an alert that Joe Smith, who's been the traffic manager at, at um, you know, at uh, ABC Shipping for, for five years and who you've never been able to get into that account because because he's always working with two other two of your competitors. Well, then you get you get the alert that Joe Smith has left. He's retired. That's huge. Exactly. Exactly. So and and, um, it, and it could work the other way too. Is somebody that uh, well, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But that that's where it's a little disappointing for us at Blue Book if only the credit manager is getting this information because we think account representatives throughout the organization are going to want that. Yeah, I mean, it could be the same. It could be the other side of the table too. It could be, hey, I've been working with this you know, this potato customer for five years and all of a sudden my guy, unbeknownst to me, left, retired, got fired, whatever the case might be. I got to, I got to put on the sales mindset and sales hat there and hustle to make a new relationship with whoever took over that person's job. Um, Ben, I, I mean, we talk about this a lot with prospecting is like, you know, what, you know, you might call on a, a, a shipper so many times and you get no, 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 but we say it's inevitable. Every single person at some point is going to leave that job, whether it's retirement or switching careers or whatever the case might be. But to have to have like an active notification about that, I think is huge. Well, yeah. And especially prospecting wise. So one, you're kind of ahead of it. And two, like, I mean, not only that, people get promoted, people change. I think the average person now stays at a job like between one and a half and three years. So, I mean, it's becoming more and more common with what happened with during the pandemic and, you know, just more turnover within positions. And like, think how helpful it is to know that before you make the call and you're not surprised by it because you can proactively have a much better conversation when you're calling a facility and you already know that your point of contact has moved on, right? Your trust, your just, your ability to have a conversation goes up with the more information you have. It just makes it that much easier. So I want to, I guess on the prospecting discussion here with that, I guess this this part of the conversation, um, talk about being able to target search for a specific, you know, produce company or something like that. Um, what I, I guess what sort? I mean, we we already, we already know about the credit side. What other kinds of um, criteria can you know would someone have access to? So, are we talking about commodity or vault, like their annual sales? What, what kind of stuff can we actually sift through when we're looking through the database? Yeah, I mean, commodity is one that would that would come to mind. Um, you know, scale of you could you you could use the credit worth estimate as kind of a proxy for the the scale of the company. Um, and the, you know, if if you if you only want firms over a certain size, or if you're looking, you, you think you got a better pitch to the to the smaller companies, you could you could search that way. Um, you know, the, the, those are the those would be the the uh, applications that that come to mind. Yeah, that's good. I mean. Ben, you've used this analogy before or this situation in the past where you're like, hey, if, you know, if you know that the top guy at your brokerage, if he, if he's moving, I don't know, I'm just going to make this up. He's moving onions, right? And, but you know, obviously his customer is not available. Maybe you want to search for onion shippers uh, and you can go in there and you could target them, right? You, you Obviously, if you want to go by a smaller size because you know the top 
10 onion shippers out there already taken, well, boom, there you go. You can sift through the database and um, target them by their size and whatnot. So that's good. And then another thing too is, and we'll get, we have a question on this later. So when we were doing, I don't know if it was with, with you or Jeff, who also works with you at Blue Book, uh, we were kind of looking through some of the commodities, the commodity tool or, you know, like people ask us, is there a produce calendar, right? Um, so what kinds of information can somebody get it? Let's say they're, they're in, they're in brokerage. Maybe they've been doing it for five years, but they've never dealt with a certain fresh food commodity before. And let's say they want to, they want to start working on, they have an avo- avocado prospect customer shipper. Um, what kind of information would be available to them by, you know, searching through blue book? Yeah, there, we, we've got we've got a publication called um, Know Your Commodity that we've published for years, and there's um, there's a, a chart in there called seasonal seasonal availability, and it'll just just show you in what you know in what seasons you can expect avocados to be coming through out of, you know, through Texas or, or through through Nogales, um, it, 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 or you know Mexico. It'll give it, it'll give countries in states. So for instance, lettuce, it'll show Arizona at one time of the year, and then I'll show it transitioning into the, into the central Valley, Valley of California. Um, yeah, so that's I'll good. Keep, I mean, yeah. we try, Ben, we tried to do our best to make a super simple, simplified produce calendar for the community out there. And it's so tough because you could say like, yeah, these months of the year, <clears throat> commodity shipping, but until you know where it's shipping out of, it doesn't really do you any good. Cause it, let's say, you know, for example, you want to prospect, avocados but you don't know you know and you might find oh yeah they're they're shipping for like a handful of months throughout the year but how how do you know when to call for that cross-border stuff coming up out of central america and mexico unless you actually know what time of year those geographical locations are shipping out of so that's that's huge uh like for example like potatoes right there's obviously, obviously everyone knows idaho is known for potatoes but a lot of people don't know that western new york where i live we have potato farms here too they just they don't have, I mean, we're not too far off from Idaho, but it's not the exact same time for harvest every single year as it is out in Idaho. So understanding where a certain commodity, when it harvests based on location throughout um, North America is going to be a game changer for folks out there. So yeah, I would say on that point also, you know, it, it changes a little bit according to the weather and um, our, our, our newsletter, um, it's called, called the, the Produce Reporter. It's a daily newsletter, twice daily, in fact. And every Monday, um, they do an article from Produce IQ, which really is focused on pricing, but the pricing is all tied to, to you know, harvest. You know, was, it, was it delayed? Is there overlap between, between two shipping regions or is there a gap? And so you might be able to get out in front of the seasonal availability chart and get it if you really want to refine it and realize, you know, typically the season doesn't start till June, but this year um, it, it started sooner and it's going to need trucks sooner. And maybe there's opportunity there. So you brought up a good point there that I, I don't want to fly by too fast. So obviously anything that's seasonal, we have a rough estimate on when it's going to happen each year. But this is why we stress to everyone. So everyone listening. If, you know, just because you're you're working with a certain commodity or something like that, things change, whether it's seasonality or there could be big events that happen just in the industry that, you know, that can disrupt what the normal pattern of things is. So it's super important to stay on top of what's going on in the news and anything related to transportation. So like, for example, on a broad sense, Freight Waves does a great job at giving big industry, um, you know, breaking news and just things that are going on around the the freight world, and it could be you know acquisitions of a certain carrier or a big brokerage, but in in um, the actual produce uh, world, that's huge. And getting that newsletter, like actually, I signed up for it. I think two weeks ago or so, uh, and it is it's twice a day. And it's, I'm I'm impressed at how much information you guys can pack in there twice a day. Uh, but that's the kind of stuff that if you're if you're going to get into produce or you're already working in the produce world as a freight broker. You definitely have to be staying on top of what's going on and what's trending in the industry. So, yeah. Well, and also, I mean, information, I mean, that's the value you bring back to your prospect and shipper, right? They're in the business of this. So to be able to speak to the things that, you know, Doug's pointing out just makes you sound so much more credible, right? If you can speak and understand that maybe the harvest season got pushed back 10 days because of the weather, how many other brokers do you think are having that conversation with that shipper, right? 
only the ones that are really moving that type of produce, right? Because they're saying that with the other customers. So when you go into a prospecting call and understand that, that just gives you a huge advantage over the person that doesn't know anything calling that shipper. Yeah, I mean, you're talking the talk and walking the walk. And I'll take it a step mm -hmm. further. The same thing goes with talking with carriers because, you know, carriers will demand different rates based on what they are, what in their mind, what the capacity and availability of trucks looks like. So you might have someone that says, Oh man, it's uh, it's citrus season right now. Yeah, I'm not taking that for two bucks a mile. I want three fifty a mile. It's like, well, actually, you might think that because that's normally when it when it kicks off this time of year is this time of year. But the reality is fill in the blank, right? Based on what's going on, because you I mean you could have, and that's actually big too. If you know, for anyone that's a, a carrier has a has an asset division as well with their brokerage, understanding what's going on, it's going to affect the demand for trucks in a certain region. It all comes down to seasonality with produce. Well, and here's the other thing. Produce typically will flip a whole market, at least in a region, right? So like when produce comes in, like specifically in Florida, it's really noticeable because it's a peninsula. But like when watermelons come to season, like you'll see the rate coming into Florida drop from whatever. We'll say it's 2.30 a mile on average. It'll go down to like a dollar. But the rate outbound will go up to like you said, 350, 4.50. And if you're not prepared for that, and let's say you're not shipping produce. Maybe you're shipping steel coils right out of that same lane and you're across the street from where a lot of these things pick up, you know, per se. Like that's going to affect your rate. So, I mean, like this is a huge impact on what's actually happened in the transportation market. So having some lead into that is also super helpful just for brokerage in general, I think. Yeah. So we, I mean, we covered credit a little bit. We talked about the prospecting side of it. Um you know, we're going to have a whole entire episode that goes in detail with the claims facilitation and something surrounding that topic. But um, outside of, you know, the, the credit and the prospecting and having access to shippers and stuff, what other kinds of, um, you know, things are provided through Blue Book? So like, for example, obviously I brought up claims. Talk a little bit about that. And is there, is what are, what are the other big, um, you know, usage or um, reasons that someone would, you know, have Blue Book and what would they do with it? Yeah, I, I think, about, you know, where we talk that a truck broker, in addition to being a truck broker, there's this other aspect to their job being a credit extender. Well, I, there might be this uh, another aspect to their job being um, being a, a, a resolving disputes, um, particularly in, in, in produce. And it's one thing, you know, if it's just one opinion against another opinion, it's, it's a lot of times it's it's hard to, to resolve that kind of thing in an amicable in an amicable way. Um, so Blue Book has a neutral third party that, that, that does this with a, you know, dedicated um, individuals you know, working full time on this. Um, we can provide a, a source where you can point to our, you know, if you're saying, I think this, and please see our Blue Book's transportation guidelines, which, which say, you know, something similar to what I'm saying, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so to use, a, instead, of, before getting sideways with your with your customer um, or your carrier having a having a neutral third party to uh, to to point to to help help you through that dispute um, can 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 save relationships and just add professionalism to the to the process. So you guys are essentially acting as like a, a a mediator in some of those disputes. Then correct. What, what, and you might wonder, well, you know, how how do we get into this, or what are, what are we doing in that? Well. Claims come in just like we, we talked about where we solicit from from the industry feedback on other firms. Well, we also, um, when we get the claims in, we don't just report that a claim was filed. We actually look at the merits of the claim and try to resolve it. But if, if it's a meritorious claim that's not been paid, we'll report that. Um, but if there's no merit to the claim, if it hasn't been supported, we won't report that. So it's additional information to the trade. We're essentially getting into the dispute and looking at the, and, and assessing the merit of of the of the dispute. So, okay. as part of that, because since we have, you know, we you can imagine our shoes a little bit where we've got a customer and a prospective customer or two customers on either side. We want to have um, guidelines, so we're handling it consistently. Sure. Um, so, so we're pointing to to our guide. So, so we we work hard on that. We work hard at giving the reasons for the assessments of these claims that we that we provide. Okay. I mean, it's kind of a similar thing with, um, like I've seen it with a carrier files on a broker's surety bond. It's the job of like the, the bond company is like, all right, give me your side of the story. Give me your side of the story. And then, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to give you my feedback on it as, as like a, thir a neutral third party. How about, um, let's say like, what about collections? Is there, a, is, do you guys deal anything with like either unpaid invoices or 
unpaid claims or anything like that? Right. Yeah. We, we kind of think, look at it all as one because a lot okay. of the disputes, you know, they're, they're, they're kind of um, maybe not real legitimate. They're, they could be a, a, just a slow pay or a no pay that's made to look like a dispute when really there is no dispute, or it could be a bona fide good faith dispute. So we, we kind of wrap them all up together. Either way, they would appear in our claims table. Either way, you'd be able to see whether the, the claim was a produce company making the claim or a transportation. That's interesting. So that I, I didn't think about this. Is it is it a common, I mean, I shouldn't call it a common practice, but does something like this happen where let's say um, a produce shipper, their books are tight for whatever reason, right? They're they don't have the cash flow that they want to have or that they are used to having. Will they basically just erroneously say like, you know, or dispute something to buy themselves time to pay an invoice? Is that a thing? Well, you know, we, we kind of don't, we don't take it to that level. We, okay. we basically just say um, you got to be able to, you can't just claim a claim. You got to be able to support your claim. So gotcha. if you accepted the produce, you're, you're liable for the full invoice price, less any damages you can show resulted from a breach of contract. How are we going to prove a breach of contract? Well, most of the time with, with produce, it's, you need a USDA inspection certificate, a timely USDA inspection certificate, or in Canada, it would be CFIA uh, inspection certificate to prove that the product failed to make good arrival. It, furthermore, they got to prove they're going to have to prove the temperatures were normal to prove that breach against the seller. So that's where trucks kind of get wrapped in there. Yeah, I I, I'm going to pick your brain on that a lot in an upcoming episode because there's, you know, I've seen a lot with um, a receiver claiming one thing, the shipper saying something different, the actual carrier themselves giving a third thing. So we're gonna we're gonna dig deep down the rabbit hole on on that in a future discussion for sure. Furthermore, like I've seen shippers that will do it almost as a matter of like policy unethically where they like know a portion of the shipment won't make it to the receiver they stuff it in the truck anyway to claim the carrier for it and go let's use a broker we're never going to use that carrier again anyway put it all in the truck who cares if it makes it and they're like yeah let them claim it and we'll just tie that carrier up in it later and like there are yeah, definitely shippers that will do that out there and i mean i'm going to be interested to dig in that further too yeah um, well, we're going to get to some of the Q&A part here from the community. But first, I'm going to give a shout out to our friends over at Lean. Lean Solutions Group is the industry leader in nearshore staffing solutions with offices in South America, including freight broker, back office operations, accounting, tech development, business development, marketing, customer service, and many other positions. To learn more about the vast solutions that Lean can offer your freight brokerage or agency, visit them online at www.leangroup.com. Um, so, I mean, I already asked, I'm going to do these out of order from our, our notes here, but the the one question we already kind of hit on is how do I know what time of year certain produce is shipping? And I think we've kind of unveiled um, two answers. So on a macro level, like big picture, um, you know, there's a general time of year for each region when a certain commodity is going to come out of there. And I think that's, what was it called? Know your produce at the, the portion of the website? Know your commodity. Know your commodity. Okay. So I think that's huge. But the other the other half to that answer is um, knowing what's going on this year and right now. And I think that's where the um, the twice a day newsletter is uh, is going to be is going to be beneficial. So I guess on that note, uh, how do you how does somebody sign up for that newsletter? It's called the Produce Reporter. And okay. uh, if you if you Google that, you'll get you'll get prompted to, to sign up. It's free. You don't need cool. you don't need to be a Blue Book member to get it. Awesome. Well, that's a pretty straightforward one. All right. Um, next question. What produce is miserable to run versus what produce is a breeze and why? I, I mean, I, I want to kind of preface this with um, miserable to one person might not be the same to somebody else. So somebody might be like, man, I hate all produce. It's miserable because it involves, you know, having to deal with reefer units and is it continuous? Is it cycling? I got to worry about pulping, USDA inspections and you know, temp recorders and, um, but someone who's seasoned at it and understands how the produce industry works, that's not miserable. It's just part of doing the job. Um, Ben, is there a specific commodity that you can speak to? I've got a couple examples that I can give, but any commodities that you've dealt with or folks that you've worked with have referenced as like, stay away from this one. Blueberries, raspberries, and asparagus off the top of my head are, I think, the three that I see most brokerages have some restrictive policy around. Either 
you can't move them unless you have moved other produce or you kind of work in that niche. They very rarely will let newer brokers kind of work in them because they tend to be high claims. And I mean, Doug probably knows. I mean, what are the commodities with the highest claim percentages typically? Yeah, yeah I mean, I'd say asparagus, strawberries. Um, I was interested. You said blueberries. I mean, we do get a lot of that, but I wasn't sure if that was just the quantity because I don't think of blueberries as being as perishable as strawberries, raspberries, um, and then the bag, the bag salad products. Yeah. And then the, the cherries are always, I would be worried with cherries just because of the price of those suckers. What? Salad too, huge. I knew a broker anecdotally years ago and it was like huge margins. Also a lot of claims and a lot of what Nate just referenced, right? Like, you know, there's a lot of procedures around it, but they paid large margins because again, short shelf life, if it's not getting there, a day or two matters a lot because you lose either in the grocery store or when you buy it to your house, right? No one wants to buy a bag of lettuce. It's going to be brown tomorrow. So what is it about asparagus? It's for a vegetable product. It's highly, it's highly perishable. Oh, okay. You're right. It it doesn't seem, I know what you're saying. It doesn't seem to go bad in your, in your refrigerator, but it scores poorly very quickly. Okay. Little fraying of the, um, I forget what's even called feathering of the tips, feathered tips. Okay. So yeah, we, we see. It also takes a very long time to grow. And I just learned this like fairly recently. I think at average, it's like two years for a crop of asparagus to grow. I don't think it grows in a season. It's a very long period of time. I guess you got to go to know your commodity and and look (laughs) that one up. (laughs) So I've seen, yeah, like you guys named all like the the berries and stuff. And, um, and the reason for it is they tend to have the the higher claims percentages on them. Um, Two years, by the the way. Yeah. Asparagus takes two years. A single row of 10 to 12 plants will produce a decent crop after two years. Interesting. You so won't be able you, to harvest your asparagus for the first two years after planting. So, so longer I'll time. Give, outside of claims, I'll give an example of commodities that I've run into that are can be a headache when it comes to the pricing of the transportation. So potatoes, and I know I've referenced this, but if they're, if they're priced per 50 pound bag, you can get into a very, very messy situation on, on the freight spend side. Reason being, um, carriers like to know exactly what they're going to get paid. So if you tell a carrier, hey, this is going to pay you $4,000, cool. But if you're like, well, it's actually not $4,000, it's $5 a bag and you have to load X amount of bags to fully scale up 42,000 pounds to get paid that $4,000. And if you actually load 100 bags less, you're going to make less money. So there, there's the pricing side of it that can be a headache for certain people. And that's why uh, in, in the past, I ran into a situation with this and we just made the decision like, Hey, for this specific customer, we've had issues on, um, you know, what they said we could scale versus what the actual amount tended to be. We said, we're going all in flat rates on them. We're not going to be dealing with short pays anymore because it, it just causes a headache. And if the care, you know, if you load a hundred bags less than you originally thought and you were quoted on, you might get short paid by your customer, but the carrier is demanding full payment because they weren't disclosed that portion of it on their, you know, their rate confirmation when it was tendered over to them. So those are certain things to think about is how it's priced, obviously the shelf life, um, the the rate of claims on it. So those are those are just little things when it comes to, I guess, um, produce being miserable versus a breeze. Here's the other uh, question too, I want to point out too, for people to just take note of. Whatever you are billing or receiving money for from your customer, do it the same way for your carrier because that's what's going to keep the consistency. Do not quote flat rates when you're getting paid per hundred weight um, or any of those variables, because again, it's just, you're creating a headache for yourself down the line. And yep. again, to your point, make sure you not just put it on the rate con because it is very common for carriers to kind of overlook some of those things. Make sure you're reiterating this at dispatch and you're confirming and telling the driver again, because if the guy leaves and then finds out you have a much larger headache than if you do it prior. Yeah, that's why like a scale ticket or, you know, the, the BOL after the, the shipper signs it agreeing to, hey, this is what's loaded on the truck. Getting a, just even take a picture on your phone, have them sent, you know, have them sent to you to get the ARAP updated in your TMS. Um, last question. What did you wish you'd know before you started to haul produce? Um, I mean, we kind of hit on a lot of this already is not all produce is the same. Um, there's higher claims on some versus others. There's the potential for higher or lower margins on some versus others. And it all comes down to, like we talk about the the consequence of if a certain commodity does not hit the shelves in a certain amount of time, 
Uh, it's urgent. It's more urgent than like steel or lumber where it can sit there for weeks, right? So those are going to be, um, you know, higher or bigger opportunities for you, but they also require more of your time. There's more touch that goes into it. Uh, ben, do you have anything you want to add on like what you wish you'd know about produce? No, to be honest, and, and that's what I really like too about Blue Book. Like, honestly, if I was going to get into this, I would do the same thing that you and I have been doing. I would start reading their newsletters and I would dig in and learn as much as I could about the produce I was going to prospect before I did. Um, and that's really how I would go about it. And the things I didn't know, I would make sure I'm asking that shipper, right? Hey, what are your policies? What are your procedures? What do you have your carriers do? And make sure you're writing that down and you have that line item out because your shipper should be telling you this during the procurement process when you're getting onboarded anyway, but you want to be at least aware of the things that you should be asking as well. So yep. that's how I would kind of approach that. Definitely. Well, Doug, before we wrap it up here, I want to give you the opportunity for, um, you know, for Blue Book in general, how do folks find you guys online? Obviously we talked about the, you know, know your commodity and the newsletter, but where, where do folks find you online? How do they sign up as a new member? Uh, it's uh, producebluebook.com, and uh, you know it, it should it should lead you from there. Uh, if not, uh, you know Google our phone number. The least give us a call, and uh, we're happy to talk. We'll make sure we leave a link down in the uh, description box for the podcast, or if you're watching on YouTube, we'll put it in the description box for the video. Um, Doug, any anything you wanted to cover that we didn't hit on today before uh, we wrap things up here? Oh, I probably said said enough, but. You know, I, 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 I am wheels are kind of turned a little bit on the, you know, you, you're saying that produce can be a breeze or it can be miserable. Um, you know, I would I would want to I, I would suggest that it's more likely to be a breeze for a guy with a trailer that's got good insulation uh, versus one that doesn't. Um, and maybe we can we can elaborate that on a future show, but maybe get that out there now. Yeah, the um, the ducks, right, that go down the side of the trailer. Is that what you're talking about? I the, the the thickness. Of oh, the, the actual, of actual the trailer walls. The insulation. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. we we see some trailers that do a great job uh, controlling temperatures. You know, the, the the focus is always oh the reefer operated fine. It was on a continuous continuous mode. Um, but the problem is we'll get a portable recorder and it's showing warm temperatures in the in the rear of the trailer, and you can see when the ambient temperatures go up and it's ninety five degrees, you can see it's losing the temperature control. Well, that doesn't happen in every in every trailer though. Um, it happens in, in some trailers and, you know, the, the insulation, the level of insulation within the trailer is a factor there that, that sometimes seems, seems to be overlooked. So if I was hauling, uh, you know, hauling a high value load out of Salinas, um, I would want to know that, that this trailer is new and properly insulated. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've seen, we'll get more into claims in the future for sure, but I've definitely seen where a temp recorder, or if you pulp, a product in one part of the trailer versus the other, you're not going to get the exact same, you know, results on that. So very, very good point. It's a good tip. Um, all right. It's time for me to take a look at the bills week two, and then Ben will look at the Steelers and then Doug, you can give us Michigan state take, for Saturday. So as you're, as you're taking a look at that, I want to point out something for everyone else is that I don't know if you picked this up, but the railroads might be going on strike as of Friday. In fact, I got noticed that NS, Norfolk Southern, stopped receiving cargo as of yesterday. And if, I don't know if any of our listeners haven't seen this on the news, take a look at it. Because whether you do drage or not, if they shut the railroads down as of Friday, the amount of loads that are going to hit the spot market for everybody that ships, even if they don't go on rail, is going to shift. Because the things that yeah. have to move are going to get moved. And their trucks that are going to go move that at higher rates because they just found out about it. And they're going to leave vacancies and they're going to leave rejected loads at other shippers. And it's going to disrupt the market significantly. Yeah, your, your dry van, dry van market specific. I was talking with one of one of my agents this morning about it. Um, yeah, if that happens, that's going to be huge. All that stuff that was going intermodal across the country on, on rail is now going to be on a truck. So. Yeah, and it's like right now the railroads are preparing for it by not receiving any cargo. I think NS, like I said, shut down yesterday, and a lot of them are now discharging their hazmat cargo so that's not stuck on a train. But, I mean, you're talking huge numbers of cargo that are not going to be moved, and it's going to have to move on a truck, and that's just going to create more opportunities for brokers out there. So keep yep. an eye out for that and start talking to your customers about it. If you haven't, ask them what they ship on rail. Ask them what they would be shipping on rail next week and ask them if they've got another option for it because they may or may not have planned for it. This is a great way to get some value added to get some more freight. Good point. All right. Bills, 
hosting the Tennessee Titans Monday night. I think there's two Monday night games this mm-hmm. coming week. Um, this is an earlier one. I think it's like 7:15 Eastern. Um, Bills have played the Titans four years in a row now. This is year five. They've gone two and two. Uh, Bills are favored by ten points. I'm 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 saying they're going to win by double digits. I'm going the same thing as the Rams. You got the Steelers hosting the Patriots. Um, your two point underdogs. What do you think, Ben? Can they pull it off? New England's for anyone that's a New England fan. I'm sorry, but the team's yeah. not what it used to be right now. It is not. I think the quote this morning on Pittsburgh radio was, this isn't your older brother's uh, Patriots. This isn't the Patriots from the early 2000s. So, I mean, I don't know. They got a shot. I mean, without having, you know, their major defenseman, TJ Watt, we'll see. It's not like, you know, Trubisky lit the world on fire. So, we'll see. Hopefully he shows up. Yep. And then, Doug, you said, who are the Sparks <laughs> playing? Washington. Oh. Washington, primetime Saturday. There you go. What do you think? Are they going to take take the W there and prove who they are? I don't You know what? The, I never, I'm too close to it. I can't even, (laughs) I can't even guess. All right. Fair enough. I'll I'll be rooting for him. So, all right. Well, Doug, it was awesome having you on the show. We'll we'll be having you on again here um, probably in a month or so. And I'm looking forward to it. That one will be, we're going to dig into claims on that one. I'm I'm looking forward to it. That's, there's a lot of stuff to, to unpack when it comes to disputes and claims and, you know, what you can do to, to better handle that process. So, Uh, We'll see you again soon. Ben, any final thoughts here? Whether you believe you can or believe you can't, you're right. And until next week, go Bills. That wraps up this episode of Freight 360. Check out the show notes for links to anything that we've referenced on this episode. And make sure to visit us online at Freight360.net to see our entire library of episodes, videos, blogs, and more. And make sure to check us out on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily and weekly tips and content. If you'd like your question answered on the show, fill out the Contact Us form on our site and we'll see you next week.